Hi, I'm Jim Bavarsky. I'll be talking about Awkward Array, a library for uh, p manipulating JSON-like data with NumPy-like idioms. Okay, so what do I mean by that? JSON-like data with NumPy-like idioms. Um, so suppose that you've got a data set that is essentially like uh, JSON. You can have variable length lists, um, uh, objects with fields and uh, arbitrary kind of nesting structures. And say we want to represent this as a kind of array. And in particular, we're doing that because we want to scale this up to, to something huge. Um, and also, we want that array to have uh, NumPy-like features. So for instance, you'd be able to do operations on it uh, as though it were a NumPy array, like um, multidimensional slices. Here, we want to take the array and pick element two. That's this last list. Everything inside, so that's both of these records. Field Y, OK? And then say the last element of the field Y lists, 404 and 505. So we get that as a new array, 404, 505. Uh, and that's a multidimensional slice. Now suppose we want to do some mathematics on it. Let's say we want to take a square root of something. Uh, first, we do another slice, taking all of the outer, all of the inner lists, uh, field Y, um, element 0 within the field Y list. So that's just these guys, the 101, 102, 103. And I want to subtract off the square root of the equivalent for X, the 149. So then we have 101 minus the square root of 1, 102 minus the square root of 4, 103 minus the square root of 9, and we get 100, 100, 100. But look, we still have the structure of the thing that this came from. We have these three elements are grouped because uh, they came from these three records. This next one is empty because it came from this empty list. And then these next two uh, come from these two records. Before moving on, I'd like to give a table of contents so that you can skip ahead or you can come back to different sections uh, and you'll be able to find them again. So the first thing I'll be talking about is uh, why does this awkward array library exist? And here I'll be giving a motivation from particle physics. After that, I'll be giving a uh, so-called live demo uh, exploring a data set uh, with a Jupyter notebook. Uh, here we'll be exploring uh, Chicago bike paths as a data set. Next, I'll be presenting the scope of the library by talking about the data types that it covers and how it generalizes NumPy. Uh, next, I'll be talking about awkward arrays in Numba, uh, Numba the just-in-time compiler, which is a particularly uh, interesting use case. Finally, I'll talk about how it works uh, and describe what I mean by uh, columnar transformations and give a layout of the library uh, before uh, finishing with conclusions. OK, let's start by talking about why does awkward array exist. And this is where I'll be talking about particle physics, because that's where this project came from. So uh, why not? Let's go way back uh, and talk about in, in 1964, a group at Berkeley sifted through 100,000 photos to find this one, tracks left by the decay products of an omega baryon. So there's the omega, and there are the things that it decayed into, all in, labeled in the photograph. Uh, the, the omega decayed into a xi, the xi decayed into a lambda, and the lambda decayed into pions and protons. Uh, and they only knew that this was an omega because uh, they could reconstruct the entire decay chain. Only an omega would decay in this particular way. And so they had to find all of these tracks and label them appropriately. Today, it's the same kind of thing, but everything has been scaled up from photographs to digitized signals to trillions of events, algorithmic searches. And of course, uh, we have 3,000 authors on a paper. Uh, but we have the same combinatorics problem. The tracks aren't labeled. So to show an example of that, um, uh, k kaons uh, decaying to two pions, let's say. Uh, in order to find such, uh, such a decay, we need to loop over all pairs of particle tracks, because we don't know which ones are the pions, but we can tentatively label them as pi plus, pi minus. Uh, then we calculate some m, which is the uh, 
uh, the energy, the sum of energy squared minus the sum of momentum squared. This formula comes from special relativity because uh, if this really was a k on decaying to two pi ons, then uh, that is the mass of the k on. And so if we plot the, the results of this calculation uh, in a histogram, uh, they pile up at the k on mass. These are the real k ons to, to uh, decaying to pi ons, and the, the rest of this is, are not real. Uh, these are random tracks. And then we can apply this technique successively down the decay chain. Higgs goes to ZZ, one of the Zs goes, decays to electrons, the other decays to muons, and then you see a peak, um, a mass peak for the uh, uh, newly discovered Higgs boson. But data structures are essential to this. Uh, you notice that I was looping over uh, a variable number of tracks in each event, and then there's this trillions of events. Um, uh, data structures have always been essential for this, and you can see this by uh, software packages like from 1976 had to add data structures to, to Fortran at a time when Fortran itself didn't even have uh, the for loop. This is before Fortran 77. So we've always needed this. Today, physicists use C++ and Python for analysis, Python only very recently. In C++, uh, we can just write for loops if we're not doing stuff on GPUs uh, to walk over these data structures. So we know how to do that. But in Python, we have a difficult choice. NumPy is fast, but it's limited to rectangular structures. Pure Python is slow, but general. So that's why we created this awkward array library to be able to uh, use a NumPy-like interface and NumPy-like performance, but doing it on uh, general data structures. Now I'd like to show how to use awkward array, and I'll do it by exploring a data set, one that has nothing to do with particle physics, uh, bike pads in my hometown of Chicago. So this is, uh, it's a GeoJSON file. Um, there are bike paths all throughout Chicago. And this file in JSON form shows uh, street names, some metadata, uh, and some latitude longitude coordinates uh, for all of these paths. So we'll start by loading them in. And then we'll load it into Awkward Array. And now that's what it looks like. It's highly uh, abbreviated because there's more data than can be shown on a line. So let's, uh, let's start by looking in finer detail at this data type, the uh, awkward array's equivalent of uh, NumPy D-type. So this is a complex object. It contains strings, strings within nested records. It has variable length lists. It has option strings, so some of these strings can be null. And the coordinates themselves are in a list of lists of lists of numbers. So let's uh, zoom in on those coordinates. So bike roots, and then use square brackets to slice just as in NumPy. Uh, we want to go down the features, geometry, coordinates, and there we have it. Now this is an array of just the list of lists of lists of numbers. Now I could have typed it uh, like an object with dots, and that's just a uh, convenience. So uh, now to, uh, let's, instead of looking across all of them, let's focus on just one of them. Ha ha. Okay. So this one, Martin Luther King Drive. Um, the I picked it because it has uh, a rather large number of separate paths. So you have to pick up your bike and walk it every now and then. 
um, to show why we have lists of lists of lists is because not all of these uh, paths are contiguous. All right, now let's uh, delve into the uh, latitude and longitude coordinates. Bike routes, features, geometry, coordinates again. And now uh, we'll use a get item to slice the zeroth because those are the longitude. And the oneth is the latitude. So now we've just pulled this information out of the JSON uh, in something that would have required a loop with appends. And look, we've even maintained the triply nested structure. Now we can run NumPy functions on this. Uh, and that's because there is an awkward function that deals with it. Uh, and we use NumPy's uh, extension mechanisms uh, so that when NumPy uh, encounters an awkward array, uh, it dispatches to the right awkward function. And like most uh, uh, NumPy functions, this has an access parameter, but the access takes on special meaning uh, uh, now that the, uh, the dimensions can have variable sizes. Okay, and to focus our discussion, let's say that we are trying to find the length of all of these paths. So in order to do that, I first have to convert the longitude and latitude into distance units. Uh, and I'm doing that by subtracting off the mean, which we can do because we can use NumPy. And then uh, I convert the degrees of longitude and the degrees of latitude into kilometers because I happen to know where, where on earth Chicago is. Now, to find distances and given points, we have to take uh, pairs of differences between neighboring points. Now, the way that we would do that in NumPy is we would, given an array like this, we might take the, the whole path and everything except the first and subtract the whole path and uh, everything except the last so that uh, they're staggered. And then when we take the, uh, the difference of them, we're taking differences between neighbors. Now we want to do the same thing with uh, these awkward arrays, uh, and we can do it even though uh, they have variable lengths. Now here I'm just looking at the first one, and yeah, we can take differences, um, but then we can do it for all. And it still works, even though they all have different lengths. It says that each individual one matches up in length where you need to subtract them. Okay, so now that we know how to take differences, we can uh, uh, compute distances because those are just the differences in the x coordinate squared and the differences in the y coordinate squared. And now we have segment lengths. So going back to our example of Martin Luther King Drive. I spelled it wrong. Now you see for the first path, we have all these pairwise distances. Second path that had only one because apparently it had only two points to begin with and so on. Now uh, we have these pairwise distances. We want to make path distances. So if this were a NumPy array, we would use oops, NumPy sum, which is awkward sum, same deal, same difference. Uh, and we would do that along the deepest axis. Uh, and so then we can do this to get 
all of the path lengths, even though they have different lengths each. And since there are multiple paths for each one of these, these roots, we just sum it up again to get that. Now, we could have done this with Python for loops. And it would look uh, something like this. Uh, we take a loop over the outermost structures, um, over you know, all the, the streets. And then we'd have to take a loop over all the polylines within one, one of these routes. And then for each latitude, longitude coordinate in the polyline, uh, we would calculate distances. Uh, uh, and then we'd have to append, append, append onto all of these lists in order to build it up. And I'm running this now to, uh, to get the time. So 50 milliseconds each time through, not bad because this is not actually an enormous data set. Now doing the same thing uh, with awkward array. It's some five times faster. And uh, this happens to not be uh, the most impressive speed up. Uh, it happens to just be a good example to use pedagogically. And also, the original problem is pretty small. When you scale it up, the, the five times speed up becomes something like an eight times speed up. Uh, but it's, it's easy enough to construct examples where you have, say, a 10 or 100 times speed up. Uh, because we are in the scale of uh, uh, NumPy-like compiled loops uh, rather than uh, Python for loops. Now that we've talked about awkward array in uh, real analysis, I'd like to talk about the data types and how we generalize in NumPy in order to clarify the scope. So for data types, to start with, we have numerical types, uh, everything that NumPy does. Numbers, booleans, equal size lists. And we add to that variable size lists, also known as jagged or ragged arrays. And nested record types. Uh, these can have named fields or unnamed fields, and named fields act like a set of uh, regular dicts, and unnamed fields act like a set of regular tuples. The option type allows anything to be none or anything to be nullable. The union type allows for heterogeneous data, so you can have different types in a single array. And internally, these are different arrays. Indirection is not so much a data type as an array feature. Uh, you can have an integer array point to items in another array. This is, think about like a dictionary encoding in uh, arrow or parquet or uh, uh, pandas' categorical type, where you have a small set of strings in one array and a large set of integers pointing to those strings in another array. Arrays can be partitioned. Uh, they, they can be discontiguous uh, for parallel processing. And they can be virtual or lazily loaded. And often, virtualness and partitioning go together. Arrays can have high-level behaviors. Uh, you can subclass the arrays and give them special methods. So like a space-time point can have a boosting method to boost into a different reference frame for, for doing some physics. And strings have a special equality definition. Uh, we, we generalize, uh, one of the things that we generalize about NumPy is its concept of broadcasting. So in NumPy, you can uh, do operations such as adding uh, two arrays with different dimension. Here we can do it if uh, one of them has variable length lists and the other one doesn't. Uh, so in this example, we add jagged plus flat, the 100 from the flat array broadcasts to each of the one, two, three of the first sub list, the 200 broadcasts to nothing, and the 300 broadcasts to the four and five. We also generalize NumPy's reducers, uh, such as product in this case. Um, and we can reduce along any axis but uh, we have to define what happens if some lists are shorter than others. 
Um, what we do in that case is we left align things and the, the gaps act like identity uh, for a product that that identity is one. Uh, if what we have to define what happens if you have none and none serves as a placeholder to keep this from being completely left aligned if that's what you want to do. Uh, and none acts like the identity as well. Uh, we generalize NumPy slices. Um, uh, particularly if you have a NumPy structured array, you can have uh, uh, string value call uh, string valued slices to pick out columns and uh, integers or arrays or or slice objects to pick out rows. And we can do that same thing here. And another feature that uh, structured arrays have is that you can do the column slicing or the row slicing in either order. Same thing is true here. It introduces some uh, commutivity between the uh, column slicing and the row slicing. Um, if you have something which, uh, if you have records inside of some structure such as this jagged array, slicing by only the uh, record field can give you a new jagged array of just the inner contents, and that's quite often useful. Uh, we can do advanced indexing, like NumPy's uh, uh, slice by array, say Boolean arrays or integer arrays, uh, except that ours can be jagged as long as the lengths of all the uh, inner lists match the lengths of the array that you're slicing, uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can slice by jagged Booleans. And in some cases, we have to create completely new functions, such as Cartesian product per element, that's this axis equals one, or combinations without replacement per element. Uh, and we're often using that because we'll have uh, one of these sublists will be a collision event, and we want to find all combinations of particles in this event with these other particles in the same event, and not cross between different events or find combinations across different events. Uh, and so uh, having a NumPy style function that, that with an axis parameter allows us to uh, express this uh, physics need in a, uh, in a very general way. Next, I'd like to show how awkward arrays can be used with Numba, where Numba is a just-in-time compiler for Python. Number provides a new decorator, number.jit. Uh, when this is used on any Python function, that function is labeled for compilation through LLVM. And as long as number is able to compile the function, as long as it can figure out what the types of all these variables are, uh, then that compiled function can run as fast as specialized C code. Uh, awkward arrays have been registered as number extensions, so they could be used as arguments to a number compiled function like this. Uh, they uh, the awkward array provides the detail type information that Numba needs in order to uh, figure out what all these variables are. Uh, and it's implemented as a zero copy walk over the original array buffers, so it, it's pretty fast. This particular example implements the bike route uh, length calculation from the live demo. The Numba compiled version is some 50 times faster than the version that used only awkward arrays and 250 times faster than the pure Python version. And this uh, looks just like the pure, pure Python version because um, that's what Numba does, it compiles Python. Um, and uh, uh, since it makes a single pass over the data and there aren't any intermediate arrays and no uh, 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 reducer bookkeeping overhead, uh, this is probably about as fast as this particular problem can be solved. Contrasting the, the benefits of Awkward Array by itself and with Numba, Awkward Array by itself is array-based programming, so familiar to Numba and, uh, sorry, NumPy and Pandas users, whereas Numba is imperative, more familiar to programmers. Some calculations can be easier to read this way as, as array-based expressions, and others are easier to read as algorithms, uh, especially iterate till, until converged. Um, it just depends on what problem you're working on. Uh, awkward Array is all uh, pre-compiled operations, whereas Numba just-in-time compiles things, so there's a one-time cost for each function. Uh, complex formula require intermediate arrays, just like NumPy, 
Uh, so multiple passes of the, over the data and um, it, it loses a little bit uh, of, of performance due to that. Whereas number, the number of passes over the data just depends on the number of for loops. Uh, but with awkward array, it's, it's easy to generate complex output. Um, at least as complex as the input is, is almost trivial in an awkward array. Whereas a complex output from Numba requires a new mechanism. Uh, the awkward array library provides such a mechanism. It's, it is called array builder. It's an append only structure for, for building arrays. Uh, and it can be used in Numba. In fact, it's motivated for, uh, for use in Numba. With it, the, uh, the kind of array that you build depends on what methods you call. Like if you say begin list, then we know this is going to be a jagged array. Uh, it's going to be uh, something var something. Uh, then when we start filling with integers, it knows, ah, it, there's going to be integers inside that jagged array. And as soon as we put in a floating point value, you say, oh, OK, back up. The integers have all become floats. It's a jagged array of floats. And when we close it, uh, then that adds one uh, array element to the, uh, to the output array. Uh, for variety, we'll make the next one an empty array, because you can do that. This is really jagged. It can have any length. And in the next one, let's put a null value where we used to see the, uh, the numbers. Now it knows it's not just a jagged array of floats, it's a jagged array of nullable floats. Uh, and the, the data structures are swapped out uh, in, uh, in an efficient way. It, it maintains a tree that grows in order to uh, keep up with the, uh, the changing data type. And the idea is that as you fill something that, that happens to be regular, uh, most of these uh, type changing surprises happen near the beginning of the data set. So now let's go completely crazy. And in the next one, instead of putting in a number, we'll put in a record. So to define a record, we, we specify a field X, and then what you fill it with, a field Y, and then what you fill it with. And just for fun, let's make it a nested list. At the point when we uh, put in a record, now it knows that this nullable floats have to be a nullable union of floats and some kind of record. And then it finds out that there's going to be an X field, but it doesn't know what's in it, uh, and so forth. Uh, and so with this mechanism, uh, in the for loops of a number compiled function, uh, you can build up something the same way that you might uh, build up complex output by uh, printing these characters to print out JSON data. Before I conclude, I'd like to talk about how this works. Uh, as Awkward Array is the only library that I know of that does data manipulations, uh, structure changing manipulations on purely columnar data. So to begin with, all of the Awkward Arrays are columnar data structures. And that by itself is not novel. Uh, uh, Apache Arrow uh, is an emerging standard for uh, putting arbitrary data into columnar data structures and uh, shipping them between libraries. Um, uh, and so we use a columnar uh, representation as well, one actually that's uh, zero copy compatible with uh, Apache Arrow. And what I mean by columnar is that uh, data that looks like this um, uh, gets so-called shredded. Uh, all of the values of the, say, the X field get put into a single contiguous buffer by themselves. And all the values of the Y field get put into a, a contiguous buffer by themselves uh, so that the X's and the Y's are now in separate buffers. Uh, in doing so, we've lost the structure. We've lost the fact that these are records. And we've lost the fact that, uh, that these lists have different lengths. So we can put the, the list lengths back in with uh, arrays of offsets where each one of the inner lists and the outer lists begin and end. And this is a completely general technique. You can build any kind of data structure this way. Uh, once you've um, uh, represented each of these pieces as nodes, you can build up a tree of nodes. Uh, and the structure of that tree resembles the structure of the tree-like data that you are representing. Now, there's one important difference, and that is that uh, even if you had a, a, a billion elements here, the 
all with the same type, the tree would have only five nodes and it has uh, arrays attached to it. And those arrays are what would have the, uh, the billion elements. So the complexity of this tree scales with the, uh, the, the size of this tree scales with the data, data type complexity, not the uh, volume of data. And that can be useful. Now that's a columnar representation. Uh, Awkward Array does columnar transformations. So if you wanted to do something like this, where you uh, uh, keep all the outer list, keep all the, the second level lists, um, pick out the, the Y field and uh, slice off the first element from each of these inner Y uh, lists, uh, you can do that without having to turn this columnar representation into uh, record-oriented structures and then transforming them back. So you can do that if, if you have the, the Y offsets split into starts and stops, where, where this is where each list starts and this is where each list stops. You can do this transformation by just adding one to the starts. So I'll do that again. Back up before. And then for the after, we just add one to each of the starts. And now this data uh, in the logical representation is gone. Even though the values, this 11 and the, uh, uh, the 12 and the 13, uh, are still in the, the buffer representing the content, they are gone from the logical representation. Um, and that's useful because with all of the operations being immutable, uh, you can share these buffers. You can use the same uh, data before and after. And since those tree structures scale with the complexity of the data, you can write all of this in pure Python using NumPy tricks to do the, the manipulations. Uh, and that's just what we did. Um, in September 2018, we released awkward 0.x and just increased the, the version numbers uh, on the zero branch. Um, and uh, uh, it became actually uh, quite popular in um, among particle physicists, one of the, the, the more popular uh, Python packages in particle physics. Um, and it used uh, only NumPy tricks. Uh, and where we f the problem that we found there was not performance, it was uh, the complexity. These were uh, some of them very clever tricks, and they had corner case bugs that uh, is where we're spending most of our maintenance. So to move on and, and, and build this, uh, because we know it's a popular library, uh, we, uh, uh, we rebuilt it with a, uh, a three-layer architecture, uh, where the top layer is the user interface. What uh, the data analysts see is all in Python. And this layer uh, overrides NumPy's ufuncs. Uh, it defines awkward arrays as a column dtype and pandas, and it registers as an extension type and number. Um, and that's all done in Python because that's uh, uh, clearly the easiest way to do that, that kind of work. Then the data ownership and navigation, by which I mean um, the ownership is the uh, uh, reference counting all those buffers so that they get deleted at the right time. Those are all shared pointers in C++, which are bound to the Python reference counts through uh, PyBind 11. And the navigation is walking over those nodes, like the five nodes for the billion element data set. That's re-implemented in Numba in a different way because Numba needs uh, uh, a different representation. Uh, so we have two implementations at that level uh, that both feed into the, the Python interface. And then even the C++ classes don't do all those array manipulations, like uh, adding one to the, uh, uh, the field-wise starts, as I did on the previous slide. Uh, those array manipulations are done in a separate library called CPU kernels. And these have a, uh, a simple extern C interface with the outside world, so that it's very pluggable. Um, and this is just a suite of about a uh, hundred functions uh, that does each one of those uh, pieces in the array manipulation. 
And these for loops are very optimized, very vectorizable. And part of the reason for separating them out like this is so that we can now write uh, GPU kernels that uh, have the same function interfaces and do the same things, but they run on a GPU. And then all of these awkward arrays can be uh, running in a GPU. And that's just what we're doing. Um, uh, Pratush Das and Anish Biswas are both uh, uh, summer students working with me on uh, implementing these GPU kernels to have the same interface as the CPU kernels. And when that's done, um, sometime this fall, uh, the awkward arrays would be able to run on GPUs and interface with CuPy instead of just running on CPUs and interfacing with NumPy. Although this awkward array library was motivated by a particular need in particle physics, I hope I've convinced you that it has many other uses. Uh, we're open to collaborators. Uh, I'm interested to hear what do you have in mind. So uh, thanks for listening, and I'll see you at SciPy.